morning. Yeah. It's good to be here. Uh, good to have y'all here. Uh, I'm sure you've been, uh, you know, it's it's always good to, to make the effort, you know, to come out to Revival. You know, we had a week and a half, and, and I sure enjoyed it, Amen. and uh, the Lord certainly blessed it, um, but, uh, you know, we've had a chance to get rested up since then. You know, it, that, that's a lot... That's a, a lot, but uh, the Lord certainly appreciates Amen. people. You know, if you're hungry for revival yes. and you make the effort, yes. <laughs> you know, to pray and uh, seek the Lord's face and, and come to revival, um, that's certainly a good thing. But um, if we're going to have revival, you have to want revival. Amen. It has to be something, uh, you know, prayer and uh dedication and things like that that's that's the only way you're going to get revival because if you don't want if the church don't want revival you ain't going to see revival um so i'm in uh matthew chapter number six today so i believe that's about where we left off Um, I'm just going to read through, so I don't exactly have a main theme. I, I, I reckon we're just kind of going verse by verse is pretty much how we're working our way through Matthew. So uh, I'm going to start in chapter 6 and uh, hopefully at least get to somewhere about 19. So, so again, this is uh, Jesus, and this is the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, where he's, you know, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He got, had the multitude follow him, and uh, he's telling the Jews and all those there how they ought to keep the law, uh, what what they ought to do, um, exactly how things are. And they had boiled down religion to pretty much just a physical, fleshly show, is what they had done. So. When he's telling them, you know, if you're actually going to keep the law the way it's supposed to be, it's it's an intent of the heart. It's not just Amen. in phys physical things that you do. And uh, so the Pharisees, they had it all uh, physically where people could see them and some of these fleshly things going on. Uh, but he told them, you know, keeping the law, there's a lot more to it than that. I mean, all throughout the Old Testament, uh, I believe Psalms in several places said the Lord knows the, the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It says uh, he, he searches, you know, the, the inward parts of man. He knows what the intent is. And so you have a lot of people, whether it was the Pharisees way back then or people today that think <laughs> they can get by with uh, a kind of fleshly religious show. And they think, you know, by them doing that, they're a good person. Or it's, but, but God knows your thoughts. He knows your intentions. And he knows whether it's legitimate or if it's just trying to show off to other people. Because unfortunately, I don't care what denomination, what church, every church on the planet has got some kind of pride in it somewhere. We, I mean, we all got some kind of pride in us. But... That's, that's not the way it ought to be. Um, if you know about Jesus, Jesus came. I mean, the God of heaven came as a wrapped in sinful flesh, born in a manger, in, or born and then placed in a manger in Bethlehem. 
and he made himself of no reputation. Amen. He humbled himself. He came as a servant. He washed people's feet. You know, it, and if Jesus could humble himself, I think some of these, you know, high class, uh, upscale Christians can do the same. Um, they had a uh, men's meeting over at uh, Pleasant Hill back in February. It was a Tuesday night. I think they do one a month or one every couple months, maybe one a quarter. And there was a preacher there from down east in the state. And uh, he preached a real good message, but uh, he had one thing that, that I said, you know, that's, that's pretty profound. He was talking and he said, uh, he said, man, some of these preachers, they, some of these Christians today, he said, they act like they've got more standards than Jesus. He said, he said, we can't just put ourselves up on a perch and pretend like we're so holy and righteous that we can't go across the street and give a gospel tract to somebody or shake somebody's hand or welcome them into the church. We can't put ourselves up here like we've got all these standards when we can know and read the way that Jesus Christ operated. I mean, he came, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's what he came to do. But when you have these Christian folks that, you know, look down on everybody and place themselves on some kind of holy pedestal you know they're so holy they're about ready to float off the ground that's a problem um, because I mean you may have been like me you may have been raised in a Christian household and maybe you were always brought up around the things of God maybe you never got into that bad of a mess but I'll tell you one thing you were lost at one point mm -hmm. you may have not got out there like some of the other ones but you were just as lost as they were Amen. and it's by the grace of God that you had a praying mom and dad or a praying granny or something like that it's by the grace of God the Lord got you at some point some way um, but you could have been just like anybody out there in downtown Asheville when you drive through and you know look and see some of the things going on uh, in America today but it's by the grace of God that we are what we are uh, he saved us and pulled us up out of that miry clay, placed our feet upon the solid rock, said, establish my goings. And he said, he put a new song in my heart, and many shall see it and fear and shall trust the Lord. So if, if it wasn't for the grace of God, we would, I mean, we'd all be lost. We wouldn't even know anything about Jesus Christ. If somebody hadn't came way back when, I don't know, you, you know, you, you may say, well, my, my great grandpa, he was a Christian. And they was a Christian before him. I'm going to tell you, there's a time when your folks wasn't Christians. Yeah. There's a time when Europeans, they didn't worship the Lord. They didn't worship Jesus Christ. They worshiped Thor and Odin and Diana and Zeus and all the other ones. Uh, but somebody, at some point in time, got the gospel to, to, whether it's your folks or, you know, maybe you got, maybe you're the first one saved in your family. Either way, Christians should not put themselves in a little religious box and try to put themselves above Amen. other people. Um, religion, it's a true, true religion, according to the Bible, is helping people out. It said helping the, the fatherless and the widows, doing things like that. Religion ain't, uh, you know, dressing nice and, and doing certain things. Religion is helping folks out, and that's, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. So if, if we ever get to the point where we get so... You know, self-righteous that we don't care about people, then you've missed you've missed the point. If we're if our goal as a church and as Christian people ain't to tell people about Jesus and it ain't souls to get people saved, if, if that ain't our goal, then we've missed the mark. We've come up short. We might as well do something else on Sundays if we ain't interested right. in the uh, soul winning business. But anyway, so that's my <laughs> introduction rant. Um, so. We're in chapter 6, verse number 1. He said, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, 
they have their reward. He goes on here, and he tells you the kind of stuff that was going on with the religious crowd. And these guys, boy, they were the, the upper echelon in Israel. The Pharisees, they knew it all. They were put on a pedestal. Man, those guys, they really know their stuff. But he exposes them all here for being a bunch of self-righteous hypocrites. They did these things not to glorify God, but they did it to glorify their flesh. They did it for their own selfish reasons. They wanted people uh, to come, sort of look to him, look to them, reverence them instead of doing it uh, for God's glory. So therefore, I just read that. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. So there he's telling them, if you're going to give money, you're going to do something like that, don't go in and blow a trumpet for everybody to see. But they was doing that. He said, don't go in and announce it. You know, I've, uh, <laughs> I've heard some, some pretty bad stories of... Uh, one church in particular around here, a bigger church, and uh, man, they had uh, all these people donate money to make a new building. And uh, they said, you know, whoever donated the most money, because they, they had some, some, some big wigs go to that church, they said whoever donated the most money, they'd march them in and gave them like a special, boys like, uh, they, if they donated $20,000 or something like that, they'd march them in special, you know, give them their special people. In front of the church, and just have, they said they, they the people, they said the half of them that donated don't even come to church half the year. They just got money, uh, donate their money, and they said they marched them in. You know, made a big show over them, but that's not that's not how it ought to be. Uh, that's not how it ought to be at all. If you're gonna do something, do it in private. You know, we, we don't have a we don't post a, a scoreboard anywhere. Uh, the Bible tells us, you know. You give what you have. I mean, my goodness, there's people that don't have much at all. But what they give, that's even more. So what if a millionaire gives a couple thousand dollars? I, uh, you know, the Lord's more interested in uh, the old lady that don't have much money that gives what she has. I mean, uh, you remember the story of the feeding of the 5,000. That boy, he gave everything he had. Uh, the... Uh, the loaves and the fishes, he gave everything he had. So it's not about keeping score or doing anything like that, but uh, you better believe the Lord knows who's legitimate, knows who's doing it for the right reasons, and knows who's just putting on a show. And when, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Amen. Same thing again. The, the reward that they're after is for people to notice them and for people to say, boy, that, that bunch, those guys there, they're spiritual. But when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So same thing. Uh, if you've got the right intentions, the Lord will bless you for that. He's not going to bless and put his hand on a bunch of people who are trying to draw attention to themselves. If you're doing it to edify the church and to glorify God, the Lord will bless it. Uh, anything else, any other fleshly thing or to put on a show or do anything like that, the Lord ain't going to bless it. He ain't going to put his hand on that. But when you pray... Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Amen. So when we pray, we pray to God from the heart in your own words. You don't have, you know, you, we don't repeat prayers. We don't do the vain repetitions. You have that all over the world. You have uh, vain repetitions take several forms. The uh, lamas in, t in Tibet use a prayer wheel. So they have a little uh, pinwheel uh, and there's little strips of paper on it with prayer requests on them attached. And every time the wind blows the pinwheel around, 
you know, they think the prayers get taken up to heaven for just having a piece of paper and the wind blow the prayer wheel around. But that's not the case. That's what you got out east. That's what that's what they do in Asia. Um, more so in the in the Western world, you have the Roman Catholics. Uh, they got their rosaries, you know, their big bead necklace with the cross on. They rub that. They rub those beads and they repeat their prayers. You know, uh, Hail Mary, full of grace, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, they repeat prayers. That's what they do. And they think, you know, the more times they say it, the more times they rub those beads, they're getting something accomplished. But here's Jesus right here. He ain't in that. Because if you're just repeating something, it has no good. That's that's pagan superstition. You're just saying something or you manifest it or something like that. If you're not praying from the heart to God about something, that won't do you a bit of good. A prayers to dead saints or even repeating a prayer to God won't do you any good if your heart's not in it and you're not, you don't mean it. I mean, that's plain and simple. But that, that was a pagan thing. He said, be not like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So what you've got right here, again, you'll find in Matthew here, especially the Sermon on the Mount, you're going to find a lot of, I'll say, Jewish things. There's a, there's a Jewish coloring up to the cross. So we, we call this, some people call it the Lord's Prayer. This ain't the Lord's Prayer. We call it the Lord's model prayer. If you want to see Jesus' actual prayer, uh, go to John chapters number 15 through 17. That's, his, that's Jesus' prayer. Uh, but Jesus ain't here asking for sins to be forgiven. Jesus hadn't sinned. So he's telling them, he said, when you pray, you pray like this. That's his model prayer. And uh, what do people do? Um, they take this prayer right here, the Lord's model prayer, and they completely violate verse number seven because they just repeat it. I mean, before a football game, you know, you'd, you'd have one or two of them stand up there and say, okay, let's pray. And uh, sometimes we'd actually have people pray, and then sometimes one of them come up here, hey, let's do the, the Lord's prayer. And then they'd repeat that prayer. The heart ain't in it when you're just repeating a prayer. He just told you don't use vain repetition. You can say that uh, our Father prayer. You can say that twenty times if you ain't if you don't mean what you're saying and you're just saying it to say it. It don't do you a bit of good. So this our Father prayer. Um. Obviously, I said uh, where where it says there, Thy kingdom come. Uh, this is what the Jews are going to be praying. In the tribulation, they're going to be praying for the kingdom to come because they're expecting it. But I, right. I said, I'm not praying specifically for the kingdom to come. I'm praying for the church to go because yeah. that's what's got to happen first. Yeah. So, yes, we take this prayer and we apply it practically. Of course, you know, ask what you need from the Lord, you know, every meal, you know, daily bread. And you ask for your sins to be forgiven, obviously, and for the Lord to take care of you. There's nothing wrong with it praying but if you're just repeating a prayer that that's exactly what he told us not to do is repeat a prayer but uh, we call that the lord's model prayer so here it goes on for if you forgive men their trespassers your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you if you forgive not men their trespasses neither will your father forgive your trespasses um those two verses right there that is completely pure law uh, that is completely old testament law right there um, a christian doesn't forgive somebody else to be forgiven a christian forgives somebody else because he's already been forgiven he doesn't do it to try and be forgiven and and i'll show you that there's plenty of verses but we'll go to ephesians 4 real quick i'll jump over there
Ephesians 4, 32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So, before really the New Testament, so we got a page here that says, you know, New Testament, and then it starts there in Matthew. But truth be told, uh, these New Testament principles, uh, we've said before, there's a lot of Jesus preaching to Old Testament Jews under the law, preaching about the kingdom. He's talking about the tribulation in certain periods. Um, these New Testament principles are introduced, but if you want to know when the New Testament actually began, it began, uh, it's not instituted until Matthew 26, because Jesus said, this is the New Testament. Here is my body and here is my blood. The Last Supper. He said, this is the New Testament. And then you read over in Hebrews, it says that the Testament can't go into effect until the testator dies. So when Jesus died, that's when, you know, obviously um, this is New Testament. But if you want to know specifically when the New Testament began, it was paid for. By his blood. It was when Amen. he shed his blood. That's Amen. so we've got the page there that says New Testament. You gotta realize Jesus showed up under the law to the Old Testament Jews under the law and had to show them how they're how they're supposed to keep the law. And that's what he's doing right here. And of course we know what happened. Uh, they rejected him, so uh, one thing led to another and, and we'll get into all that. But that they're talking about trespasses uh, being forgiven it's not that it's not true but it's a Christian under grace the Lord's already forgiven us you don't have to do something to be forgiven but right there he's telling the Jews he said the Lord ain't going to forgive you unless you forgive uh, their trespasses so it's like that Schofield note that I read and if you have a Schofield Bible that's about one of the best reference ones you can get read that note where he's talking about the Sermon on the Mount and some of those things, how they apply to Jews. Uh, we get the practical application, spiritual application to Christians, um, but it is a, a, an important observation. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Again, same thing. They have their reward. When these men would fast, they'd make their face look rough, you know, not wash, put a little dirt on it. I've seen that before, uh, not necessarily when fasting, but uh, so I used to work. I used to work security and I'd work uh, uptown in Asheville in some of these homeless places and I'd see them and then there's this woman well she'd go in and she takes some I don't know if it's dirt or what she come out you know they give them free housing they give them all this stuff uh, free medicine free meals all that stuff but uh, she'd go in she'd still get her cardboard sign she'd go out and panhandle but before she did she made sure she go get some dirt and some stuff. She put it all over her face. She make herself look so rough and poor, and go outside and pan and ask for money. So uh, that's a pretty deceitful practice. Um, but that's you're talking about somebody homeless in Asheville. This is the religious leaders of of Israel making their countenance look rough, their face look rough, dirty. Uh, you could tell they was fasting. You know, just probably walking around oh I'm so weak you know I'm, I've been fasting they wanted people to see them and that's that's the fact of the matter they weren't doing it Amen. Uh, to glorify God you can fast all you want uh, what's his name Gandhi fasted you, you can fast all day long and you'll, you'll go to hell if you're not saved and you're not doing it for the right reasons fasting won't do you a bit of good um, if you're not Truly praying to God. I mean, with your heart, not repeating stuff, not doing it for show. I mean, I mean, Muslims, they have uh, every year they fast. I think during Ramadan. 
and they fast all the time. All these religions fast. They don't do them a bit of good. Maybe some good for their health. I don't know. People need to lose some weight. But other than that, it don't do them a bit of good spiritually. So, and I'm going to get to probably 19 through 21. And then I'm going to probably stop there and jump over somewhere else. So that was pretty much all of chapter 6 through verse 18. He's talking about prayer. And how they ought to pray. And how we ought to pray. You know. And how we ought to do as far as. You don't want to do things fleshly. Um, the Bible says God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So if you're doing a bunch of things fleshly. For your own fleshly pleasures. And your own pride and ego and attention. Then you're doing it for the wrong reasons. <laughs> And uh, truth be told, if a lot of Christian people would examine their selves, they would notice that they do a whole lot of things that they think is spiritual, but they're doing them for the wrong intentions. They have the wrong Amen. motives. That's when I find that that's my most problem. Yeah. Being vain. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So he tells them here, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So that's a pretty that's a pretty important statement. I know that's one people memorize. But I don't think we think about it uh, quite as often as we should. If you meditate on that scripture and take a look at your own selves, you know, don't just read scripture like you're reading any other book. Uh, let it, let the Holy Spirit speak to you and show you what it what it means. So lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Everybody does that, and you know you do that. Everyone does that. Everybody's got their picture perfect idea. Of what they think their life's going to be at some point. You think it's going to be like this. I'm putting this much money in my 401k every year. If it grows by this percent. Uh, the house will be paid off this year. Uh, you can go right through it. Um, I'm not saying to abandon all responsibility. And you know not pay your bills. Uh, of course money's important. You've got to <laughs> be smart with it. But. If the best hope that we had in this life was that you can get your house paid off, have a few million dollars sitting in the bank, and then you die, that would be a pretty miserable life. But we've got a better place to go. If, if my hope was nothing more than, hey, I'll make a couple million dollars by the time I'm 65 or 70, but uh, I don't have Jesus, I never have any kind of real hope, I don't have the blessed hope that, that's talked about in the Bible, we'd be pretty miserable. Amen. So as a Christian, we're not supposed to lay up treasures upon earth. Why? You, you have a nice, it's talking about moth and rust doth corrupt. You get you some nice clothes, put them in the closet, eventually the moths are going to eat them things. That's what's going to happen. Uh, you can lay up all the gold and everything else. Eventually, it's going to rust. Maybe, maybe after you die, it's going to rust. Whoever gets it, it's going to eventually rust. Something's going to happen to it. And where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. And where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So our heart is supposed to be set on heaven, things in heaven, uh, laying up treasures in heaven rather than things down here. Amen. I'm not saying you can't have a nice car or boat or something like that, but I'm saying we're a spiritual people. Right. We're Christian. We belong to the spiritual body of Christ. If, if Christianity is a... Uh, an accent piece 
to your life, if it's just something on the side or something like that, or a social gathering, you're, you're in it for the wrong reasons. Amen. If it's not the driving main focus of your life, and all that, all that other stuff's extra, your health, that's not, that's not promised. A long life, that's not promised. Money, that's not promised. That's just extra blessings from the Lord. Amen. That's, that's, a, that's a luxury. You know, not everybody gets that. Uh, things happen. But the fact of the matter is, if you know that you're saved and you know where your soul's going and you live every day to glorify God, that's what matters, not anything else. Um, so, fleshly religion, uh, pious people, pious Christianity, that stuff is all fleshly. It's all down here. That stuff fades away. The Lord don't reward that stuff. If anything, you can get punished for it. Um, you ought to have the right motive. The goal is to glorify God and win souls for Jesus Christ. That's the goal of the church. I, you know, I come here. I like the fellowship. I enjoy it. I need it. I need the preaching. I need the encouragement. I, I love the songs. I love the worship. But if we lose sight of our mission Amen. as to tell our friends, family, the community, the world, you got the internet now, you can get it out to everybody. If, if we lose sight of that mission, then we've lost sight of the whole thing, the whole goal of the church. You know, we're not here as just uh, some encouragement until you get to the point where one day you're going to die. You know, we're not just limping through. We ought to do like Paul said and press toward... Uh, the mark of the of the high calling of uh, Jesus Christ. Not limping home, just kind of oh well, you know things are going bad for me. And uh, you know, Christians, if anybody in this world has a hope that we ought to be victorious and have that mindset, it ought to be Christian people. So you know things happen. And uh, I, I see it all the time, you know, people, I, this stuff happens all the time as far as you know, people say, why'd God let this happen? Or they start, they start questioning God. But the, the fact of the, the fact of the matter is this, you know, this, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. This isn't the end. I mean, my goodness, if all, if all we had in this life is to grow old and one day die, and that's it. That's a miserable life. Amen. If that's it, and that's what most of the world has. So anything God blesses us with, we ought to be thankful for, not take for granted uh, some of these things, not question God, even though it's hard sometimes. So we've got weak, fleshly, human minds, uh, but the Lord knows what He's doing. I like that old song, um, you know, farther along. Like, I don't know why some of this stuff happens. I don't know why some people die earlier than we expect. Some people get sick. Uh, some of this COVID stuff went on. You know, we had, we've lost plenty of people these last couple of years, even these last couple months. Uh, but I know the, the person that wrote that song, they were going through the same thing. He said, farther along. We'll know all about it. Amen. Farther along, we'll understand why. Amen. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. And I don't have that whole song memorized, but I know there's a verse that says, you know, we're oft made to want, or when death has come and taken our loved ones. And then it goes on to say, farther along, we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. But in the meantime, we're still pressing forward. We're still doing what God wants us to do. Don't, you know, live a bitter, sad Christian life. Uh, Paul was thrown in prison, shipwrecked, lost everything he had. And uh, he said, those things that I lost, he said, I, I count them uh, but dung that I may win Christ. All those things he lost, he said, there's nothing. He said that I may win Christ. Amen. He was in prison when he wrote that too. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain. And that kind of thing going on. And he'd write rejoice, rejoice, rejoice all through Philippians. And he's in prison. 
And the people he's writing to is being persecuted. He said, I have learned that in whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. You know, he realized he's got a hope. He's got something better up there. This ain't, this ain't it. You know, you read the, the fairy tales when you're a kid, you know, and they lived happily ever after. That's not the case. You grow old, you die, bad things happen. But we've got something better than this, than this world. Everybody else out there may not. But the church, the body of Christ does. So, it says in Luke 12, 33, A treasure in the heavens that faileth not. First uh, Peter 1, 3 through 5. Let me flip over there. First Peter 1, uh, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us, Again, unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That's pretty powerful. Amen. That we have an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for us. Uh, and he called it a lively hope. That's something that we've got. And we're kept, here's the best part of it all, we're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. It's not something that I have to do. Amen. It's something that, that God has done. When I, when I put my faith on him, he sealed me by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. That means he, he, he uh, way back then, they'd, uh, you know, where they had a package or envelope or something like that, they'd take that hot wax and pour it on there and put that stamp on there and seal it. And now it says the Holy Spirit has sealed us unto the day of redemption. That means the package is going to get there. It's not going to be, you know, stolen by uh, somebody. It's not going to be lost in the mail. It's a package that is reserved unto the day of redemption. And he's going to open the package. He's going to claim the package. Um, it's something that we have. Um, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. So we're kept by the power of God. If grace just saved us and didn't keep us. It wouldn't be grace. If you had to keep yourselves. That wouldn't be grace. You couldn't keep yourselves. If the devil wanted to, he can make everybody in this room lose their salvation in 30 seconds. It wouldn't be hard. I mean, it's doable. You got all these uh, different religions and denominations. And I saw one guy this week um, online, you know, saying, it's a short message. He's saying, you have to purchase your salvation with your faithfulness and your endurance. And you must endure to the end to be saved. And he got that from over in Matthew where Jesus is talking about the great tribulation and what's going to be going on in Israel. And he said, you've got to purchase your salvation. My salvation is not purchased by me. I ain't got nothing to pay. Amen. I, I couldn't pay with nothing. I don't have anything good enough to purchase my salvation. You can't buy it by works. It's the blood of Jesus that saves us. That was what was paid. That's the price that was paid. And he was saying, you know, you got to endure to the end to be saved. Paul told us in 1 Corinthians that Jesus Christ will confirm you to the end. So we have a promise. I, I, you ain't got to endure to the end. He said Jesus Christ will confirm you to the end. You're kept by the power of God. You're going to get there one way or another. You may take a beating on the way there. You may be the most sorry Christian there is. You may get uh, chastisement every day. The Lord may even... Uh, take you out before your time. But you're going to get there. If you believed on Jesus Christ and you called upon his name sincerely, you're going to get there. You're placed into the body of Christ. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. You're going to make it. Yeah. He may have to drag you along, but you're going to make it. If you bless me, I'll bless you. And that's, that's what that's mm hmm flip over to 
Philippians chapter 3. Philippians. Philippians 3, and I, I know I read some of this last week, but uh, we'll just start verse 7. For what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I counted all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And skip down to verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, Paul was in as far as earthly standing he's in pretty good shape I mean he, he was a Pharisee he's one of the higher ups he said he had all these things but he said everything that he lost is nothing but manure is what he said that he may win Christ uh, and, he, and he got into pretty rough shape as far as physically but now spiritually He's probably closer to God than anybody. So, jump over to verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working, whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So he said, our conversation is in heaven. That's where a Christian ought to be. You know, these things, Paul and Jesus didn't say these things uh, to just hear themselves talk. Okay, that's something that they meant what they were saying. We ought to live by that. That ought to be first, uh, like one man said, he said, my first thought in the morning, as soon as I wake up, as soon as my feet hit the ground, it ought to be Jesus Christ. He said, my last thought before I go to bed at night, it ought to be Jesus Christ. Amen. Throughout the day, it ought to be Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and lastly, jump over to Colossians, verse number three. Verse number one. So I would say, I would dare to say this is probably one of the most, if not the most disobeyed command to the body of Christ or by the body of Christ. I would say this is the most disobeyed. He says here, and this is exactly what Jesus said back in Matthew. He said, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And he goes on to say, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, uh, evil, con, that word, uh, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So, and then he goes on, obviously, to say, put on the new man and put off the old man. So, a Christian, our conversation is in heaven. We're looking for Jesus Christ to come back. Um, our affection are in heaven. It, it ought to be things in heaven, you know. We don't do things necessarily for a reward, at the judgment seat of Christ. that You're not doing it for the reward. You're doing it because you love Jesus Christ. And the rewards come with it. Um, but Amen. we all ought to have a victorious Christian Amen. life. Yes. 
not pleasing our flesh, not putting on a show, which a whole lot of Christians do, and I can get into that, but I'm not going to. I mean, you've, you've seen it. You know exactly what I'm talking about when somebody puts on a fleshly show. I don't bless no, it absolutely does not. If, if they've got, if they want to bring attention to themselves, and boy, I saw them coming out of the woodworks COVID year, and that's all I'll say about that, you know. You remember the crazy statements about, oh, the church is empty, this is so wonderful. Empty church and empty tomb, and isn't this so wonderful? Man, that, that kind of stuff, that's not biblical. That's, that's pious. That's people, ah, I ain't going to get into that. If, if you're going to be proud, don't use the Bible to try to justify it. If you're going to make a bunch of dumb statements, don't use the Bible to try and justify it. Amen. Uh, be, be stupid on your own. Don't bring the Bible into it. So, set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So that's exactly what we ought to do is set our affections. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If all the hope that we had was stuff on this earth, we'd be in a mess. We'd be miserable. You'd go out, you'd be getting drunk Saturday night rather than, you know, getting in bed early uh, to make it to Sunday school the next morning. Uh, but thank God we've got more. And in verse 17, he said, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Every move we make, every decision you make in life, you ought to ask yourself, does this glorify God or does it, you know, please the flesh? I'm not saying there's something wrong with going fishing. Ain't nothing wrong with going fishing or you watch whatever, baseball, whatever it is. But you ought to ask yourself, is this glorifying to God or is it not? I think that would clear up a lot of confusion. You know, people, they, they, they uh, scratch their heads. They, they, they don't know what's right and what's not. Well, what about this? What's the Bible say about this? Ask yourself. Is, is the Lord okay? you got the Holy Spirit, don't you? If you think that it glorifies God, do it. If it don't, don't do it. Amen. It's not that hard. People say, well, what about tattoos? What about having long hair? What about this and that? Does it glorify God? If it don't, don't do it. That's it. Abstain from all appearance of evil. If it's something that's not glorifying to God, it's something that's not edifying the church, and it's something that's not pointing people to Jesus Christ, you're doing it for other reasons. When these Christians go out and think they can, you know, just drink and whatever, or just casually drink, as long as you don't get drunk. That's what all these modern Christians say. Is it glorifying to God to have a bunch of drinks on the table, even if you're not getting drunk? No, it's not glorifying to God. You shouldn't have to ask that. If you have to ask that, there's something loose there. Pray to God, but don't ask me. Don't, don't, you know, Christian these days, they probably just, well, what does the Bible say about tattoos? Get on the internet. See what the Bible says about tattoos. They don't have a clue. They don't read their Bibles. They're doing things for their flesh and for their glory. If you're not doing it for the right reasons, if you're not doing it because you love Jesus Christ and want to see the church grow and people get saved, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. So, anyway, I'm going to finish on that note. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely.
Amen. 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 Amen.